So what we have here is our jig geometry, and I'm going to do a little demonstration of what it does and what it doesn't do. Um, <coughs> the first thing is I've got a bunch of stuff hidden. If I turn on all of my annotation categories, we can see that there's a whole bunch of infrastructure here. I can actually just delete my element here to show you what the underlying geometry is that creates it. It's a series of rings that are looped along on a spline. And if I select each one, I have to tab into each one to get at the lines. Yeah, I'll just do those three and create a form. Then I get this form that's created through them. Let me just undo that. And I'm going to also undo back to my whole form and show you what happens when you start moving this underlying geometry around. The circles are hooked up so that the farther they are away from this line right here, it increases the radius of these circles and therefore changes the shape of the the whole form. So you're going to see this whole thing is going to get fat. If I drag this one down, this one's going to get really thin. It might even disappear. Actually, I kind of over, overdid it there. So you can see sort of the flexibility of this. Uh, and this is just to sort of show how you can have an underlying set of sort of uh, rule-based geometry that controls your form. The family itself that creates this thing, this guy right here, this is an adaptive component. And if I open it for edit, you can see that I've got a two-point family connected by a line. And if I move this thing around, my radius changes like so. And what I've got is I have a reporting parameter between point two and point one. And the reporting parameter which is called uh, data measure is driving the radius of this guy. So uh, at 25% uh, of the data measure, that's what it nails the radius at. So again, so you can see that as you yank this thing around, as I change the radius here, you can see that the radius, or the, as I change the length, the radius changes. And the way that you actually create this, I'll just walk through this really quick. So if I go new family and I go the adaptive component, I'm in Vasari by the way, that's why it's opening up directly with these families. Uh, adaptive component, I make a new adaptive component and I'm going to do reference line and 3D snapping turned on and I'm going to go kabing kabing and I'm going to select these two points and they are going to become adaptive points right there. And I want to set up a reporting parameter between these two points. So I'm going to go, I'm going to get my aligned dimension tool. And I'm going to set my work plane on this guy, this line. And that's so that it will, the dimension will move around appropriately. If I did it on the level, it wouldn't really go with these points. So um, here I'm going to tab into, actually, if you look down here, you can see what you're actually dimensioning to. And I want to make sure that I'm going to the adaptive points. One, two, to the adaptive points. And I'm going to make that dimension right there a uh, new parameter. I'm going to make it a reporting parameter. So let's call this uh, data measure. I think that's what I called it. And it's going to be an instance, and it's going to be a reporting parameter. Shabam. And then I'm going to do my circle on the vertical work plane of this. It takes sometimes a little bit of trial and error to figure out which work plane you're going to want this circle on. Um, and actually, I don't want that to be a closed loop. So I'm going to turn that off and let's go back to my circle tool. Oh, it's a reference. Let's do a reference. No, let's do a model line. Model line, circle tool, set work plane. I'm on that work plane. And there we go. Got my circle. I'm going to make this a permanent radial dimension here. And then I'm going to select that dimension and I'm going to make it also a dimension radius. And it's also going to be an instance parameter. It's important to be an instance parameter because I'm going to hook up my reporting parameter and my instance parameter there. So radius is going to be equal to data measure. Mm, we'll do it divided by four. That's what I did on the other one. Okay. And then you load into project. So 
So back in my family here, I'm going to show you a little bit about how these things are placed. I'm just going to delete some of this underlying geometry. I should just delete like all of it. And this guy's lost his host. So these guys have lost their host. So, so I've got my line here, and I'm going to take a reference line and a spline <coughs> drawn on this reference plane. Let me just make sure I've got it on the right plane. There. And I'm going to go just, well, why don't we start off with something that's straight, just to show you the change. So I have, this is actually a spline, although it's straight, and I've got my circle item here, and it's got a two-pick family here. One, two. And there it is. Now, they're not lined up nicely, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to tab select into the one, and I'm going to use this point by inter, uh, host point by intersection function, which will now make it hosted to that line. I'm going to select this guy, and I'm going to do the same thing. So now these guys are both nicely set up to line up there. And what I can do is if I scroll all the way out, I can select all of that stuff, and if I do control copy or control drag I can make a bunch of instances of these guys like so and if I was feeling fancy about it I could go and make these guys a little bit more controlled and I could uh, put dimensions between each of them like so and then after I've got all the dimensions laid out I can go and make them all equal by pushing the little EQ here see now everything's all lined up now, big deal, I've got a bunch of circles that are all in the same direction. Well, I've got my underlying geometry here, um, where if I start moving it around, we're going to start seeing those circles change their shape. Here they're getting smaller and they're coming back up, they're going to get bigger again. I can really start stretching them out like that. Just start giving myself a silly piece of geometry here. Da, da, da. Back to that sort of elephant trunk we had before. Let me give myself some real differences here. Should get really thin. And then the kind of difficult part here now is to select all these pieces so you can sweep them into one big shape. And that involves some tabbing. So I hit tab and then you can see down in the bottom left corner I'm selecting a line. So just keep your eye down here. Uh, I'll do that again. Tab, select, and then if I go over here, tab, and I'm holding down the control key and selecting control gives you an additive selection so that I can start building up all of these selections and then I just hit create form and it dies why uh, maybe this thing's too whacked out to initially make my form so let me stretch it back up now let's try that again that's how you know it's live folks I'll show the errors And last guys, let's try that. Boop, there we go. So now I've got my big form. I can grab this thing, and now everything should move with it. I don't think I'm going to have any self intersecting problems here. And you can flex it around, get whatever kind of weirdo geometry you want. Boop. And now I get my self-intersecting geometry. And what that means is that basically I've stretched this to the point where this thing starts to double up on itself. And Revit just will say, no, thank you. You can't do that. Um, because, well, I guess because it's hard to build that sort of geometry where it actually intersects with itself. And we're supposed to make stuff that you can build in the end. So here's your nice buildable, scalable elephant trunk. Thank you. Hope that was useful.